All right. Hello, everyone. So earlier this evening, I tried to do a YouTube live where we talked about annotations. And honestly, the pre-scheduled link did not work. There were some technical problems, but luckily we were able to have the live anyway. So that recording is on my channel. But unfortunately, because of all the tech problems, I couldn't screen share. So I'm currently trying to go live again and just basically do a redo and see if I can get the technology working. That way I can still do the lives that I planned for tomorrow and Friday. So if you are not already signed up to receive emails from me, then definitely make sure that you do so. I will include the link in the description of this video, a bit.ly backspace backslash CHW teacher email list. And that way you can get notifications about this as we proceed. Okay, so now let's go ahead and I'm gonna just try to share my screen and see if this even works. Hopefully there is no technical difficulties this time, but it was really stressful before. So we're gonna be talking about annotations today. And my goal in this is to give you some different ways that you can start annotations for the back to school period when students are just kind of getting used to rhetorical analysis, especially. I think back to school time is probably the most stressful for AP Lang teachers because we have a new group of students. We want to make sure that we have activities that they're capable of. And there's always this question of like, what do I do first? What do I do next? What's too much? What's too little? Things like that. So I want to try to give you some options, especially for some of the basics. So today we're going to be covering annotations. In tomorrow's workshop, we'll be talking about thesis statements. I'm really excited for that one because I've got some different activities to show you, different things you can do in your classroom to teach your students how to write a defensible thesis statement. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking about line of reasoning. And so I've got some different activities for that as well. But for the reason you're here today, we're going to talk about annotations. And so I have a method that I have since dubbed what, why annotations. This process has kind of evolved over the past few years, especially, but honestly, throughout my whole teaching career. So if we have not met yet, my name is Beth Hall. I am an AP Lang teacher from Arkansas, and my mission is to help AP Lang teachers empower their students to write effective rhetorical analysis essays. I like all three essays in AP Lang, but rhetorical analysis is my favorite. And so my goal is to help you help your students be stronger writers. So in our session today, which again is a recording because I went live earlier and we had some tech problems, we're going to be discussing what students should be annotating, the benefits of this type of annotation method, which you can adapt to meet your students' needs, and also how we actually set this up. So initially I had planned to have us practice together, but when we went live earlier, there was just such a great conversation going on in the chat that we didn't actually do it together. But in the handouts, which you can access here with this bit.ly link, so bit.ly backslash what, why annotations, you'll get that document. And you can basically have all the info that I have on my slides. And there was a little like do it together exercise that we were going to do. But honestly, I think the conversation that we had in its place was just as good. So if you already receive emails from me, you would have gotten an email a couple days ago with this in your inbox. And like I said before, don't forget about tomorrow because we're doing thesis statement activities. If for whatever reason I can't go live on YouTube, I will definitely make sure that I go live elsewhere, but definitely be checking back at 9 p.m. Eastern or be checking your email for more information. You can also follow me over on Instagram. I update my Instagram stories a lot, and I also provide links to these kinds of sessions there too for your convenience. Okay, so now let's talk about annotation and like why do students need to annotate? When we were chatting earlier, when I went live, we were talking about how there's different types of students. So we have the students who annotate everything. If you give them a highlighter, they will turn that paper fluorescent yellow. And then we have the other students who think it's like beneath them a little bit. Like they're like, oh, I already understand the passage. I don't need to annotate. And then we've got the kids in between who kind of know how to do it, kind of don't, they don't really have a system in place. 
So it's entirely possible that you're going to see all of those types of students in your classroom if you ask them to annotate. So it really helps to have a system in place, especially because a lot of students haven't done rhetorical analysis before. So the way they annotate in younger grades or the way they might annotate for like a science article or something or a historical document that they're looking at, that might be discipline specific. So you want to set the standards for rhetorical analysis. So if we have students annotate effectively, it helps them engage with the text. It helps them develop their understanding of these fundamental concepts, such as the rhetorical situation and rhetorical choices. So typically, before I have my students annotate, I have already gone over the rhetorical situation. We might have talked a little bit about rhetorical choices, and this is kind of that next step. But the problem I encountered a lot, especially as a novice teacher, was that students didn't really know what or how to annotate. So oftentimes I would see them doing like a smiley face or a check mark, all these little symbols that like didn't really mean anything. And another thing I saw was like they would annotate in the margin and they might say like repetition, but then they didn't really know why the repetition mattered. So we're going to try to combat that today with this method. So it's a little bit cut off probably because I'm on Zoom, but the what, why annotations, really simple. Um, the what is the claims and the why is the commentary. So I call it what, why annotations because I think that helps students remember what they're supposed to be looking for. These annotations help them get ready for an essay. Now, I want to be clear here because the way I have my students annotate in class, especially at the beginning of the year, is not how they annotate on the exam if they take that exam in May. But this is kind of laying the foundation. We need to do a lot more prep work now. So that way we can kind of take the training wheels off, if you will, later. So if you're listening to me go through this presentation and you're like, that's a lot of work. They don't have time for that on the exam. That's not the intention. The intention is not for the exam. The intention right now is to build the skills so that way they can streamline this process later. So with the what portion, we're having students explain what the writer is doing. And so that's where the rhetorical choices come in. We want students to try to use rhetorically accurate verbs. Now, this is where I find that I have to support my own students a lot by giving them those verbs initially, because they're more inclined to use nouns with devices, or if they do use verbs, it just might be very imprecise verbs. So I do find that I have to help build their vocabulary and support them sometimes by providing those verbs. But we want them to be, be, basically be able to make a claim to explain what the writer is doing. And I let them do bullet points so it doesn't have to be a complete sentence, but usually they start it with a strong verb. And the why part here, that's going to be the hard part for a lot of students. That's the commentary. We really want them to examine why the speaker is making that particular choice, because sometimes students can find a choice, but they don't really know why it's important. So we want them to be constantly channeling their inner toddler and asking why. I say this as the mother of a four-year-old who just figured out that he can ask why multiple times in succession. Super fun. So we want students to ask why and connect it to the rhetorical situation. So why is the speaker making this choice for this audience on this occasion? All right, so here are some rhetorically accurate verbs. This is not an inclusive list, but these are some that come up quite frequently in my classroom. So for instance, instead of having students say something like uses an anecdote, I might tell them, hey, if you notice an anecdote here and you wanna write about it, say recalls a time when, or maybe it could be reminisces on. And we want them to actually say what the anecdote is, kind of like paraphrasing it uh, in their own words. We don't want them to just say uses an anecdote because then um, we don't know what the anecdote's about. And it's really relying on that noun. Whereas if they say recalls a time when, they're kind of forced to tell us what the anecdote was about, but it also leads to some stronger verbs. Contrasts or juxtaposes. So um, juxtaposition would be the noun and it's just a meaningful contrast. I don't care if students say contrast or juxtaposes. A lot of my students don't know the terms anecdote or juxtaposition when they come into my class. And so sometimes that's a nice um, way to teach this, the high performing students something new um, where they're like getting something out of it. They're like, oh yes, I learned something. Whereas it hopefully doesn't alienate students who are kind of novice writers and still learning. Cause I found sometimes I have some students who are really strong, maybe previous English classes were a bit easy for them. And then they get into like honors 10 or AP Lang 
And then it's like, they expect it to be a breeze. And so sometimes teaching them to use these rhetorically accurate verbs is something that they haven't been taught before. So it's just enough to challenge them. But at the same time, it's not so unattainable that our, our emerging writers are totally left in the dust either. This is something that students can all work on regardless of what their starting point is, I think. So we've got compares, describes, includes or provides facts or examples or statistics that creates that logical appeal. So we don't wanna see, at least in my opinion, uses logos, uses pathos, uses ethos. I actually have a video about this on my channel. If you're looking for methods for teaching your students to address the appeal, but maybe not write their whole paragraph about pathos, because um, as an AP reader for the past two years, for a rhetorical analysis, I saw that a lot, lots of logos, ethos, pathos paragraphs, which I think is pretty common. I also read for a mock exam in our state and I see the same thing. So not giving away any exam secrets or anything <laughs> by any means, but we wanna try to teach our students that appeals are important, but they're created by the choice. So rather than writing about using logos, let's write about what's actually making that logical appeal. Is it the facts? Is it the statistics? And so we could say, logically asserts. Um, and we could talk about the, the facts or statistics and connect it to that appeal. So definitely check out that video if you're looking for more info, because I try to break it down much more clearly in that video. That one's a student friendly video too. So some of my videos are teacher specific, but a lot of them are for students as well. So you can watch it as a teacher if you'd like to, to kind of learn about it. And then if you like the video, it would mean the world to me if you would share it with your students as well. Sometimes you can just use me as this be well coach hall said and that way um, I can affirm hopefully what you're teaching your students as well. Sometimes they need to hear it from a total stranger. <laughs> All right, we also have acknowledges and justifies. So those are just other strong verbs. Depending on the passage, they might be flattering. So you might have students say flatters or criticizes, but we really want those strong verbs there. And there are bigger lists online. I tend not to give my students a giant list, but these are the ones I pull from probably the most based on what we teach, I guess. But also I try to give them some of these verbs up front and they might see some of these in different passages. And that way they kind of have this, this toolbox, if you will, of verbs they can use. Now, another set of verbs that I give my students, and this applies to all three essays, I call them commentary verbs. Basically, Several years ago, I realized that um, students were struggling to understand commentary and like they understood the concept, but they didn't know how to execute it. And I was trying to think of a way to like give them some kind of sentence frame or verb that would lead into commentary. And these were some of the ones that came up because these are all different ways to say shows. So shows is kind of like a weaker verb. Earlier on the live, we were talking about um, some teachers do like a word funeral or a retirement party. I kind of like the retirement party idea just a tad better. No offense intended to anyone who does a funeral for words. It's just that we've had a couple losses in our school community recently. And so the funeral, maybe not be the best approach, but a retirement party could be a good option. Um, so basically in these scenarios, teachers have like verbs like uses and shows, um, says is another common one or other words like um, good, bad, thing, stuff, um, a lot. Those are words that my 10th graders especially use a lot. And I have posters in my room. I'm going to try to make them look nicer and maybe share them with you all. But um, I have posters in my room that are like, instead of using the word a lot, try this word <laughs> instead. That way it's more precise. So this is kind of the same thing. It's giving them alternatives to the verb shows. And I introduce like two or three of these at a time because some of them they already know how to use. Like they typically know emphasizes, demonstrates, highlights, illustrates. Sometimes they use implies wrong. Underscores is one that they typically haven't heard before, but I tell them to think of it kind of like underlining or emphasizing. Um, so if they're underlining something or emphasizing it, they could say underscores as well. Um, but basically we want them to be comfortable using these words. I have a word wall in my classroom. Um, a couple years ago, I had a student who would like stare at the word wall and like, he'd be writing his essay. He'd look up at the word wall. He'd find the poster he was looking for. And then he'd keep writing. And I actually had, um, taken the word wall down at one point and he came back in the year later and he's like, where is your word wall? And I was like, I didn't think anybody actually used that. I mean, I knew he did, but I was like, eh, I don't know. And he's like, no, like you're going to have another student like me someday. And that student is going to need 
a word wall. And he's like, you know how you let us choose seats in your classroom? And I said, yeah. And he said, I chose that seat because I could see the whole wall. <laughs> and, and I like, it was one of those moments where like, as a teacher, I'm like, of course. Like, so I made new little index cards, put the words on it, made some new posters. And I have the word wall <laughs> um, for students like that particular one who benefit from it. And even the students who don't rely on it very much, it's like a comfort, like a crutch, like they know it's there. And then like, ultimately they've seen it enough times they don't need to keep looking at it is the goal. So like I said, you can use these verbs in synthesis or argument as well. Now these are not gonna guarantee that they're writing strong commentary. There's more to it than that, but this is a starting point. So if they're really struggling with commentary or they're just brand new at it, these verbs can at least get the thoughts coming and then we can dig deeper later on. So this is a really good starting point, especially for novice writers. So let's talk about the setup of these what, why annotations. Basically you need three columns. So the left column is for claims. That's what the speaker is doing. So that's your what column. The middle is for the passage. And so you can do this digitally or you can do it where you print it out. I'll talk about that in a second, but students can highlight evidence of the claims. They can color coordinate if they want to. They don't have to, it's up to you. And then on the right, they're gonna be doing a commentary or a why annotation. And again, we're trying to, for rhetorical analysis, connect to the rhetorical situation. So why are they making this choice for the message, argument, or purpose? I started dubbing it map, message, argument, purpose. So connect to the map um, or the, the other part of it, space, speaker, purpose, audience, context, exigence. So a lot of us use space cat as an acronym. We'll see if you can connect the choice to space. So like, what does it tell us about the speaker and his or her values? What does it tell us about the audience and the value that they might share? Um, what does it tell us about the historical context? Things like that. So we really want them to be focusing on the why. And someone in the live asked a really great question. They said, when do you incorporate the how? And I think honestly, at the beginning of the year, I focus more on the what and why. And then when we cycle back to rhetorical analysis in the spring, that's when I think I focus more on the how. Um, some students can do what, why, how very early on. And so if you are trying to challenge certain students, you might say, hey, in addition to the why, tell me how or something like that. But for the most part, I think students might not be ready for that in the fall at least or whenever you're starting rhetorical analysis. So I would say meet your students where they are, see how they do with writing claims, see how they do with the commentary. And if it's super easy, we can beef it up a little bit. If they're struggling, then that's where we need to kind of just reinforce. And someone earlier had asked, you know, how many of these do you do? Like how many times do you have them annotate? And I would say they're, they should be doing it. Like, I like the, um, the, um, like the whole class approach and then maybe partners and then maybe individuals is kind of how I like to do it. So we might annotate one paragraph together. They might do one paragraph with a partner. They might do one on their own or something. It could be more than one. Like we might do two together. They might do two as a, a pair and then, you know, finish independently or something. I also sometimes will show them the speech, especially if it's something sort of current and I can get a video of the speech. Sometimes that helps with their historical understanding of the time period. I didn't do that as much last year, but I made a note to do it more this year. I wanna show more of the speeches because they're pretty short, some of the ones that I do. So things like Reagan Challenger, um, Bush 9-11, and then like the 20 year anniversary of that. Um, there's even a video I found of FDR's infamy speech. Um, that was a little harder to find because it was kind of, the video I found was kind of cut up, but I finally found one that works. <laughs> and I think it's really helpful for students to see um, if there is a video and it is school appropriate, see that as well. So I might show the video and then we might annotate, or I might have us read the whole passage together and then we might annotate. So there's different ways to break this up. You don't have to do it the same way every time. Do what works best for your students. <laughs> Um, and something else, now that I'm thinking of it, that came up during the live is someone said, well, could you eventually have them like section off the text? Absolutely. So once you're ready to start talking about um, line of reasoning and like beginning, middle, end and structure, then absolutely. Instead of having them go paragraph by paragraph, you might be like, hey, these four paragraphs are the beginning. These four are the middle. These two are the end. What are they doing in the beginning? And you might have them annotate that way. 
when I have students go paragraph by paragraph at the beginning of the year, I don't require a set number of annotations because sometimes they might, it might be a short paragraph. There might not be much to say. Sometimes it might be a longer paragraph and they might have three bullet points. So I'm pretty flexible with it, but I do want them to be identifying these rhetorical choices. Um, it starts to build their vocabulary and their comfort with it, especially if they haven't heard of that before. Sometimes based on which passages I do, they might see the same rhetorical choice in a couple different passages. Cause someone asked earlier, like when, when do you kind of like take the training wheels off a little bit more? When do you just like let them annotate on their own and not do it as a class? It kind of depends on when I think they're ready. I might have them, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have them annotate independently and then talk to a partner and compare annotations because the kids who don't like speaking up in front of the whole class, they at least usually will talk to a partner. I'll kind of walk around the room and hear things. And then we might bring it to a whole class at that point. Like, Hey, tell me something that your group talked about. And I might put notes on the board or something. So there's different ways to do it. You know, your students and there's different ways. I think it kind of helps to change up the methodology a little bit. So like keep the idea the same, but maybe how you present it to students that kind of helps as well. So consistency, but a little bit of nuance. <laughs> All right. So here is just a quick picture of some sample annotations. This one's kind of like an answer key for something that I'm working on, but basically I find it helps to provide students with, you can see it right here, like possible choices or devices to write about. So in the very beginning, when they are just learning the vocabulary, I try to like clue them in on maybe like what I want them to focus on. And that way they start to learn those terms as well. Um, so you don't have to do that, but that is a, a way that I might consider scaffolding it at the beginning of the year. Um, and you can see the claims here are pretty simple because we're talking beginning of the year. So President Bush appeals to credibility. That is a, a claim. It has appeals as a verb. Uh, it doesn't say he uses ethos. So it's a, it's a step up. Now, as your students get better at this and they develop their writing, are their claims going to get better? Yes, probably. I also would, for this one, I would accept a bullet point with appeals to credibility because sometimes they, they don't have a whole lot of space to keep writing complete sentences. So I'm a little bit lenient with that. Um, the middle column there where it's highlighted, that's a little bit more highlighting than I would normally want my students to do. But some of the quotes there, it, I just couldn't break them up as much as I wanted to, but you could color coordinate if you want to. But one of the things that I try to emphasize when we're annotating is I want them to look for short quotes. I don't have a maximum word count. I've heard some teachers say like 11 or less or eight or less or fewer, whatever it is. But I, I feel like that's a good general ballpark, but I don't have a certain rule about it. But what I do tell my students is it's usually not a complete sentence. We usually want a, a snippet or a portion, but if they highlight sparingly, it's easier to figure out what's important. And then those quotes are easier to embed later on. And honestly, for most of my 10th graders, because I teach honors 10, AP Lang, and honors 11, which is not an AP class, and then I teach college English, my 10th graders are the ones who usually don't know how to embed evidence. By 11th grade, they do. It might be different for your students. You might encounter students who don't know how to embed evidence. So this is another skill that we might have to teach, but we can practice with our annotations. So on the right side there in that column, I have uh, some commentary. I didn't do bullet points per se. They're like full sentences there, but we talk about why he's doing it. So he reassures the public. Also, it talks about, again, like reassuring the public. Now it's possible that students might have really repetitive commentary at the beginning of the year. That doesn't worry me too, too much. I might encourage them like, Hey, use a different verb here, or maybe try to think of a different why. But if they're getting a why down, then that's what we're looking for, especially at the beginning of the year. Now, this bottom portion here where I merged those cells on the table, that is an extra step that you do or do not have to do. Um, I think sometimes it helps to get students to synthesize it, if you will. So we have our claim, our evidence, and our commentary as separate columns, but to get them to put it all together, this is like just a small portion of a paragraph. So for those who are looking for small ways to in integrate writing and to reinforce skills without having students have to do a full-blown paragraph or a 
full blown essay, this is one way to do it. This, having them do this will tell you what you need to know about their writing style, their word choice, their syntax. Do they know how to embed? Do they know commentary, things like that? So you can learn a lot from just a few sentences here. So the, the goal is for them to basically put it all together. Um, and that helps them kind of see what this process looks like. Um, but it's still kind of short, so it's not an actual paragraph, but it is teaching those skills. Um, so anyway, that's, that's one method that you could do. You don't have to add that step. I would say if students seem comfortable with the three columns, so what, and then finding their evidence and the why, then I would say, yes, go for it. Challenge them a little bit. If they're really struggling with the what and the why, then maybe don't add that step yet. Maybe wait until they're a little bit more comfortable and then add it. You also don't have to require it for every paragraph. So if there's one paragraph that you think, man, students can, should write about this paragraph, or man, I think they really can, um, maybe you do that portion for just that paragraph and the other paragraphs don't have that bottom portion. Something to think about. Okay, so if we're doing this on like regular size paper, you can print it out or you can do a Google Doc. One of the benefits of a Google Doc is that it, the text boxes will expand like the table part, I guess. So that can really help when students are trying to type things and you can, you can make more adjustments. I do printable handouts sometimes too, especially for some of the resources that I make for teachers to use, but I also try to do the digital version as well. So I, I've done both with success. If I'm being honest though, we're almost paperless at my school. So I tend to do the Google Doc version more with my students. So basically what you do is first, you got to figure out how many paragraphs you have, because we only want to put one paragraph per row. There are a couple times where I've made an exception where it was like a one sentence paragraph or there were two really short paragraphs that somehow went together. So there were times where I put a couple in, but normally we want like one paragraph. Um, and I can, when I'm making the tables, depending on like how big I make the tables and how big the paragraph is, I can fit one to three paragraphs on a page, especially if I'm not doing that bottom row where I merge those cells previously. So you're going to create your table. And so you need the three columns, one row, um, and you're going to copy and paste the paragraph in the middle column. A lot of speeches are found online. So all you have to do is just copy and paste it there. It's faster than having to retype it. And I use brackets to include the paragraph number. I don't do line numbers because that gets really confusing for something like this and it's just harder. So paragraph numbers work. Um, and you just repeat the process for the remaining paragraphs. Now you can do this on normal paper or you can do it poster size. So for poster size, I like this one for collaboration and getting students up and moving around the classroom. So I might do the paper version for one speech. And then the next time we do a speech, so maybe like a week or two later, we might do the poster size version of the annotations, or you can start with the poster. And, then, and do something collaborative. And then the next speech you do, you could do the paper size version. It doesn't really matter, but you have two options here. And again, it's that idea of like consistency, but nuance. So, hey guys, we've already done it on an eight by 11 piece of paper with our last speech, but today we're gonna do it on the poster or vice versa. Um, I tend to like to use like posters like this if I need to decorate. <laughs> so for me, this is really good when parent teacher conferences are coming because I, I can put it up and, and, you know, or if I know principals are doing walkthroughs or something, <laughs> I can, I can put these giant posters up and it shows something that the students have done, that kind of thing. Cause I'm in a hallway with our AP history teachers and they have the most amazing like product, like projects, coloring, like um, activities. Like, I mean, they're, they're top-notch teachers. They really are, but like they, they are doing projects all the time. And I'm like, all right, guys, let's write a paragraph. Um, not as fun to display. So this is something that can kind of be like, uh, if you're looking to display something, this could be a good option. So you're going to need either poster board or my personal favorite is bulletin board paper because our school has a ton of it and it's free to us. And so that really helps. Um, so you can also make it 
um, whatever size you want, because we just have those big rolls of bulletin board paper. So you're going to need one large sheet or poster board per group. You're going to want multiple copies of the text. I usually, for this, because you're putting it in the center of the poster, um, I usually add extra spaces between the paragraphs and tend to increase the font a little bit. Um, you could also print a copy, one for each student, and then put a bigger one on the poster. So if you have students who might not want to be like all reading over the same speech, or you want to have them annotate on their own first, or you just have students who might want a copy, or you know they're going to need a copy for later on in your lessons, you can give them their own individual copy, but make a bigger copy for the poster. Um, and then pens or markers, um, you could do each group has a color, especially if you want to kind of carousel and have them look at each other's annotations. Um, if you're looking for like individual students writing within a group, you might give each kid in the group a different color pen. I've done it both ways. Um, it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. So those are the supplies that you would need. Um, so you're going to want to figure out how many groups you have, make sure you have enough copies. You're going to paste the passage vertically um, on the large piece of paper, but make sure you leave room for students to annotate on either side. So basically you're creating the columns by putting the passage in the middle. You should have space to the left and space to the right for students to annotate. Um, and if you make the paragraphs bigger with like larger font, and then you have space in between, that allows them to annotate more evenly um, and they can kind of match stuff up. Because if the passage is really tiny um, and the like small font group together, then it kind of defeats the purpose of putting it on a poster, I guess. Um, you can also hang the posters up on a wall and have students write or just put them on tables or desks, that kind of thing. So that's a little bit about setting it up in your classroom. Um, and I'm sure people have done similar activities to this. Like I know doing like large posters and maybe carouseling, like have students go around when they're done and reading each other's notes. I know that's not new. Um, what I would not recommend at the beginning of the year though, is I, I sometimes do this later on in the year though, is I might have them annotate a portion and then like later on in the year, I have them rotate to the next po poster and then like each group has a different color. And so it kind of makes a rainbow and they're kind of building off of each other's. And um, that is much better for later in the year. Beginning of the year, I usually like to just keep them at one station working with their group of people annotating the passage or whatever we have. So I the carousel part for the beginning of the year is like, hey, all the groups are done walk around and kind of do a gallery walk and see everybody's annotations, see how your observations compare to theirs, as opposed to them moving every like five minutes. Um, so anyway, that's what I mean by carousel. So here is a kind of mock-up. I did this at home and I didn't have poster boards. So I used um, like Astro Bright paper. <laughs> So you can see that the passage is in the middle. We have the claim on the left side for the what and the commentary is on the right for the why. Um, to make this a little bit more advanced or to reinforce the concepts, you might consider underlining strong verbs. So have students underline those strong verbs that they're using. Um, and if they reference the rhetorical situation, you could have them circle it. That's not a mandatory step. If you're looking to make it a little harder, for students, um, that might be something to consider. If you're looking to um, like reinforce the concepts because students are struggling and you want to make sure that they're using rhetorically accurate verbs and they're connecting to the rhetorical situation, that might also be an option. All right, and so this is where I had intended for us to try it together, but we're not going to quite do that right now. So I am going to just go to the next slide. So like I said earlier, don't forget to come back for day two. We're going to be talking about thesis statements. I've got an activity that I call, is it defensible, that I normally do on paper or digitally, but I also have a new template to share with people where it's self-checking, so it like grades it for you. Um, so I will be sharing that and some um, sentence frames and other activities to help you teach your students how to write a defensible thesis statement, but cut down on some of the grading time for you. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but I'm looking for ways to streamline my process as much as possible. So 
anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. If you tuned in and definitely come back on July 7th and July 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you're interested in signing up for my email list, I'll leave a link in the description box below. But if anything changes, if we have more tech problems like tonight and I have to change the plans, I will send out an email. I'll also mention it on my Instagram stories at Coach Hall Rights. Anyway, if you found this video helpful, I would love it if you would give it a thumbs up. Feel free to mention it to any of your AP Lang teacher friends as well. My goal is to provide ideas for you as we venture back to school. If you have any video requests or any questions, feel free to reach out in the comments or you can email me or contact me on social media. I'm always happy to help however I can. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me for these what, why annotations. I truly hope that they were helpful. Hopefully you can adapt them to your students' needs in some way. So until next time, happy teaching.